Welcome to the General's Gentlemen. Asymmetric design is the art and science of making factions unique and play out differently from each other. It's a subject that's difficult to critique since asymmetry is a spectrum. RTS games tackle asymmetric design in different ways and to varying extents. Some don't even bother at all and that's perfectly okay. If you look at Supreme Commander or World in Conflict, those games work fine with mirrored factions and it's debatable whether having unique factions would even improve those games. Either way, the point of this discussion is to investigate how to approach asymmetric design and what to avoid if it's to be implemented in an RTS game. Asymmetric design is important for two reasons. Firstly, it's to add variation to an RTS game, which helps prevent it from becoming repetitive. Secondly, it allows for the different factions to cater to different player preferences. This can be in terms of play styles as well as the art and lore. Devouring your enemies with a Zerg Swarm will appeal to some, while controlling the mystical and high-tech Protoss will interest others. Since these races are such opposites, it wouldn't make sense to have the same units and abilities shared between them. Immersive factions require asymmetry to bring them to life. The gameplay quirks should be thematic to the background of that race. Zerg's gameplay embraces the Swarm by having cheap, massable units, with creeps spreading throughout the map. Likewise, it's intuitive for a Zerg drone to transform into a spawning pool, but it'd be strange trying to comprehend a Terran FCV turning into a barracks. How the factions vary from each other should be relevant to the focus and the mechanics of an RTS. If a game is built around micro and unit control, such as Company of Heroes, then the factions should have unique units and abilities, rather than different methods of economy and production. Alternatively, if an RTS game is focused more around production, such as StarCraft, then it makes sense for the three races to have different methods of producing units and teching. RTS games need to play to their strengths. If a game has fantastic combat, then don't distract players from that by having one faction with a convoluted economy. The Necrons in Dawn of War Dark Crusade only have a single resource, while all the others have two. It's confusing and makes map control less important for the Necrons. Designing asymmetric factions shouldn't involve stripping away components in order to balance out other features, but rather what can be altered or added to create fun new interactions and interesting player decisions. Company of Heroes is a franchise successful for its tactical use of combined arms, though some of the factions don't have access to core mechanics such as the machine gun teams, mortars and mines, and that just makes those factions less tactically diverse. An example of where Company of Heroes 2 does asymmetry well is how every faction has access to a tank destroyer, though they all have different profiles which makes them feel unique. Controlling a Jackson is a different experience to using a Jagdpanzer IV or a Firefly. Bad asymmetry is giving the Oberkommando West 5 levels of veterancy, which makes them objectively stronger late game, whilst proper asymmetry is making all factions balance late game, but through unique ways, such as Zerg's rapid tech switching compared to Terran's muling. Asymmetric design aims to add variation, but an RTS game doesn't need asymmetry to have variety, and a game with unique factions can be monotonous. It's more important to design factions that are diverse and have different playstyles and viable strategies within themselves. Often factions are designed around having particular strengths and weaknesses, such as stronger aircraft or additional mobility. This can be a problematic approach to faction design because it shoehorns that faction into specific playstyles, which limits player options and results in matchups becoming predictable and repetitive. Mirror matchups can suffer from this the most. Dull mirror matchups plague many otherwise great RTS games. Strengths and weaknesses can be bad for gameplay, but they can also be great, so long as it's fair, creates proper counterplay, and doesn't cripple the flow of the game. GLA tunnel networks or Zerg creep tumors grant extra mobility, but these are fair because they can be denied by their opponents, which then creates a point of contention for the players. If not implemented carefully, asymmetry can become a nightmare when it comes to balancing different types of maps, game modes, and skill levels. In Company of Heroes 2, OKW and British lack proper garrison clearing tools such as flamethrowers and mortars, so they suffer when playing on urban maps. The British do technically have both a flamer and a mortar, but their implementation is gimmicky and inaccessible, which prevents it from being a consistent counter. StarCraft 2 is affected the most by rigid map design, where a particular map formula is required to balance out how vastly different the factions are. 
For example, all main bases need a defensive ramp to balance out Zergling mobility, whilst base locations need to be densely packed together to balance out Terran medevac drops. For better or for worse, it's ultimately a core component of StarCraft's gameplay, and it's balanced out accordingly. The important takeaway is that asymmetry requires foresight to understand how design decisions require careful implementation of maps and game modes. Unlike StarCraft, Company of Heroes 2 suffers from this oversight by having inconsistent map design combined with the design flaws of their factions. It's essential that asymmetric design isn't overdone. More isn't always better and many games have fallen victim to unnecessary and excessive asymmetry. The best way to approach asymmetric design is to think critically about the focus of an RTS game. What's the core experience going to involve and how is that going to be fun for the players? That essence should be taken and diversified across the units and factions. Not to dilute it, but to reiterate upon it. Dawn of War 2 handles asymmetry brilliantly because it knows when it's okay to step back and mix in units and abilities that are shared throughout the other factions. Melee units such as Banshees, Slugger Boys, and Hormagaunts all fill the same role, yet they have distinct statistics, abilities, and upgrades which makes them play out differently from each other. While at the same time, the Shuriken Cannon is practically identical to a Devastator Heavy Bolter, and a Bright Lance platform is no different to Laz Cannon Havocs. Asymmetric design in RTS isn't inherently good or bad. It's a tool that needs to be used carefully to improve gameplay, rather than harm it by making factions one-dimensional. The aim isn't just to make factions different, it's to create a wider range of mechanics, strategic decisions, and fun micro, which gives a game more life and allows players to find a faction which appeals to them. RTS games should aim to achieve this whilst remaining fair for all factions, regardless of skill level, game mode, and stages throughout the match, whilst relying upon maps designed to embrace and balance the varying characteristics. And that's it for my thoughts on asymmetric design. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you for watching and especially a big thank you to our supporters on Patreon that allow us to post a video every day now. It's pretty much my full-time job. So if you do want to help me maintain the schedule and not be very, very poor, then please do consider checking out our Patreon. Other than that, if you're new to the channel, uh, make sure you subscribe because we do a lot of different shoutcasts for RTS games such as Company of Heroes, Command and & Conquer, and pretty old school RTS games for that matter. So other than that, all the links for my Facebook and Twitter are in the description, and the next video that I'll be covering for what makes RTS games fun is the distinction between RTT, Real Time Tactics, and RTS. It's an interesting topic and I want to cover it now because with Dawn of War 3 being announced, there's a lot of people that are like, yeah, Dawn of War 2 sucked, I hate that that game didn't have base building. And that kind of annoys me because I really like Dawn of War 2, but a lot of people didn't. So I do want to sort of explore how RTT uh, varies and, and what it actually means for gameplay. Alright, thanks guys.